Hello and welcome back. Welcome to another episode in this CISSP series which I named as Concepts of CISSP. Here we discuss certain concepts which are required to understand in passing CISSP exams. Now in this specific video we are going to discuss or uh, we are going to understand the security capabilities of an information system. I think in bits and pieces we have seen so far what are the security capabilities of information system in this domain security architecture and engineering but here we will see it in a very formal way and we will start our discussion by answering a very simple question that what are the security uh, building blocks of an information system. By information system I mean any piece of hardware or software which is processing information or processing data right that's called information system and all the theories and concepts which we build around in the field of cyber security or information security is by considering a typical information system right so when it comes to understand the the basic building blocks of a of an information system these building blocks are also called security primitives right so these building blocks are not something which has been developed uh, at, at, a, uh, at the same time like there has been an evolution of technology, evolution of uh, techniques, hardware and software and then we have a set of uh, security primitives which we will be covering in this video. So what are these security primitives? These security prim primitives are, um, are like memory protection, like virtualization, trusted platform module, cryptographic modules, hardware security modules, smart cards and security enclaves. Right, so out of all these uh, types, things which are um, which are highlighted here in green in my drawing, like uh, security enclaves, uh, smart cards, trusted platform module, cryptographic module, hardware security modules, these are collectively called secure crypto processors. By security crypt crypto processors means like their their uh, whole job is to isolate the 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 encryption, decryption and holding the security keys in a different device or in different modules so that we kind of uh, have this uh, um, security principle of domain separation enforced right when it comes to, um, to, to divide or to isolate the domains which are providing the functionality of the system and the domain which is responsible for holding the the, the, the cryptic part of the system like the, the, the process which is doing encryption, decryption and holding the, the public and private keys. So what is memory protection? Memory protection is a technique and this technique allows operating system to load multiple programs into memory at the same time and prevent one program from referencing memory not specifically assigned to it. So here as you see in the diagram you have got a CPU. Uh, which is uh, uh, which is the which is the main piece of hardware doing all the arithmetic and logic operations. It has got its own ALU, uh, its own register built inside. So central processing unit, and there are different processes it handles. Process like let's for example we have process A, process B, and process C. Now these processes need to be loaded into the main memory, which is a which is the uh, which we call generally as random access memory RAM right. So these processes are loaded there along with the process which is required to run the operating system. So you have got process A, process B and process C. So if we have memory protection technique in place it means that we have something which is called memory protection unit which isolates CPU and RAM in a way that it allows a certain programs to, to reference to the memory location which, which, uh, which it is uh, related to. So let's say we have, an ex uh, we have a process A and then memory protection unit will only allow process A to reference the memory location in RAM which is allocated for process A. When, when process A will try to uh, access something which is not related to it, let's say for operating system or process B and process C it will deny it. So you can think of memory protection unit is as some kind of access list uh, abstraction uh, built built in hardware or you know so that uh, we have uh, isolation of memory in in a way that uh, that the process uh, the specific process have 
one to one mapping to it right so process a can only access memory locations where it has those process a related programs running now since this is all in hardware it's very uh, very difficult for any hacker to 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 break it down or to hack it or to to get some type of sophisticated attack in um, in actually uh, compromising a memory protection unit uh, there are two uh, interesting uh, vulnerability around uh, this memory protection they are um, they are called spectre and meltdown i will just explain you what these uh, vulnerabilities are so before i explain uh, uh, spectre and meltdown we should first look into the common techniques used by an information system to enforce memory protection so there are two techniques used to achieve memory protection and these are uh, cpu dual mode operation and uh, aslr which is called address space layout randomization so uh, let me explain first cpu dual mode operation so it so cpu when it runs it can it can run in two mode first is called kernel mode which is called privileged mode and then it uh, enters into user mode for running the specific program so user mode is unprivileged mode so if you look into the diagram which i previously explained you have got cpu you have got memory protection unit and you have got the main memory which is ram now when cpu uh, initiates loading operating system one of its task is to establish memory protection unit and it does by entering uh, itself in in something which is called kernel mode or privileged mode now when a software runs at that time cpu moves into another mode which is called user mode or non privileged mode so as to let software run and that software uh, when the software is running since it is in non privileged mode it cannot interfere with the memory protection unit or any um, any system or any any process which is related with the operating system right so this is one way to achieve memory protection the another is address space layout randomization right so address space layout randomization mitigates the risk of predictable memory address location now if uh, if an attacker uh, wants to um, wants to attack any information system uh, main memory like random access memory the the common technique to use is uh, used is buffer of overflow now in buffer overflow what an attacker does is actually um, runs a program which uh, exceeds is uh, its allocated memory size you know allocated in the ram and it actually overflows to another um, another program's memory address now in address space, lay space layout randomization you can't control the overflow right but since the layout is randomized attacker do not have an idea that when the when overflow happens to which address location it is over is it is overflowing to right so aslr um, you know mitigates the risk of predictable location of any software program but it cannot reduce uh, the the act of overflow itself for that there are different uh, operating system patches which we need to apply or we have to follow the secure software design principles so that we we are not uh, be not affected by any buffer overflow attack so now let me explain you what is spectre and meltdown in some easy language so before i go to some analogy um, uh, you know we should first understand how a, a microprocessor or a cpu works in an information system so cpu executes task with some clock speed right so there is an inherent inbuilt uh, clock which uh, keeps uh, track of different tasks which are which is executed by cpu and there is a maximum limit of how much how fast uh this clock is running or how fast is the frequency of this clock which is measured in gigahertz or or you know megahertz right now to overcome this speed limitation what cpu does it speculates the task which is gonna come in future right which that is called a speculation so spectre actually exploits the the speculation part of the cpu execution so what cpu is gonna um gonna expect in future if an attacker knows then it he, then the attacker can get at, take advantage of this speculation right so spectre is a type of security vulnerability 
that exploits a speculative execu execution in modern computer processor. In simple terms, processors try to predict what task they will need to do next to speed things up, right? So this is just to uh, break the barrier of the, the clock frequency which they have. If they can speculate in advance and take advantage of the, of the inbuilt registers in CPU, then they can speed up uh, the, the CPU operations. And a spectre takes advantage of this prediction process. It's like guessing what the chef is going to cook next and using that information to learn about the recipe that are supposed to be kept secret. So if there is a chef and uh, uh, the chef, the, the, the recipe which the chef, which chef is uh, making is supposed to be secret, somehow if someone, uh, someone is trying to, um, to speculate that what is the next thing chef is going to make. So that is basically compromising the, the secrecy of the, reci of the recipe, right? So let me explain you in a, in a more better way. So let's, um, uh, let's assume or, or picture um, the, the chef as your computer brain, right? So the comp computer's uh, CPU, let's uh, replace the CPU with a chef. So picture the chef as your computer's brain and it's very clever. A spectra is like someone peeking through the kitchen window and trying to see what the chef is cooking. Even though the chef is doing a good job cooking different things separately, a spectre tries to spy and see what's happening in the kitchen. It's a bit like trying to read a secret recipe. So this is what a spectre is. Now, uh, to understand better, let's take another analogy. Uh, let's uh, take an analogy of a library, right? So imagine you are in a library and you want to borrow a book. The librarian, in an effort to be efficient, try to guess which book you might want based on your previous choices, right? A spectre is like someone cleverly listening to these guesses and trying to figure out your reading preferences. So what, what is your reading preference? If, do you like, um, like uh, spiritual books or novel or you know comics, those kind of things. Even though the librarian is just trying to be helpful, a spectre exploits the guessing game to learn more about your private book choices. Right? This, is, this is all about a spectre. Now, when it comes to meltdown, so meltdown is another security flaw related to how modern processor handle memory isolation between different applications. Uh, as I explained that uh, there is a, a component which is called memory protection unit, which is invoked when the computer starts and uh, it's established with uh, kernel mode. And uh, the, the whole job of this memory protection unit is to isolate different processes so that, uh, that the, when, when, someone, when process A tries to access process B or C, it is denied, right? Normally, one program's data is kept secret from another's, but meltdown could allow one program to access the memory of another. In our chef analogy, it's like one recipe being able to sneak a peek at the secret ingredients of another recipe, even though they are supposed to be kept private. Right in the uh, in the in the example of library, you can think of uh, your computer's memory like a set of locked drawers, right? And each drawer contains information for a specific program or application. Meltdown is like a sneaky character who finds a way to open drawers that they are not supposed to access, right? Even though each program's information is meant to stay private. Meltdown can sneak into the drawer and take a look at the contents, breaking the usual rule of privacy. Right. So this is, in a nutshell, uh, a spectre and meltdown vulnerability. Right. Now let's move to the virtualization part, which is very easy to understand nowadays, because we are living in a virtualized world uh, when it comes to deploying IT infrastructure. Right. So everyone is going to cloud. So when it comes to virtualization, there are certain key things we need to understand. So in virtualization, you have got a hardware, then you have got a hypervisor. Now, if you deploy hypervisor on, on, on the hardware, it is called type one hypervisor, right? So you've got a hardware, you've got a server basically, and uh, you deploy hard, hypervisor software on that server to virtualize its uh, CPU, disk, RAM, and uh, network interfaces 
So if you do that, that's called type 1 hypervisor because you are deploying the hypervisor directly on the hardware, right? Now on top of hypervisor, you deploy operating system. Now there's a second approach which is deploying operating system, sorry, deploying hypervisor on the operating system. You're not deploying hypervisor directly on the hardware, which is called bare metal uh, in technical term. You are deploying uh, hard, uh, you are deploying hypervisor on the operating system. If you do that, it's called type 2 hypervisor, right? And on operating system, you have got different applications. Now, security vulnerabilities, which we should be mindful um, you know, for CSSP exams in, in relation with uh, virtualization is that for type 1, we, you may have hypervisor escape. It's like a jailbreak. You can, uh, you have a hypervisor which is supposed to hide the, the details of the hardware and someone can uh, do some sophisticated attack and can jailbreak the hypervisor basically. So that's one type of vulnerability. The other is resource exhaustion. So um, a user can take advantage of hypervisor platform and it can do some attack on the underlying hardware by uh, by doing some denial of service attack or or using some software program which ex which exhaust its ram or cpu so that is called resource exhaustion the type 2 hypervisor can have a, a double attack surface because uh, not only you have hypervisor but you have underlying operating system so then the attack surface is doubled right and then the other attack which can happen on type 2 hypervisor is guest to guest. So you have got different operating systems running on a hypervisor. Um, and then uh, one of one, uh, you know, uh, operating system can like, uh, if you have one virtual machine, it can be used to attack another virtual machine on the same hypervisor. So these are the, uh, these are basically four vulnerabilities you should be mindful of uh, the first two. Hypervisor escape and resource exhaustion is for type 1 hypervisors um, and then or type 1 virtualization or type 1 hypervisor whatever you may say and then double attack surface and guest to guest attack is for type 2. Now when I explained uh, security primitives I explained certain uh, techniques which are called secure crypto processors. Now these secure, secure crypto processors are uh, secure uh, enclave processor like the Apple uses SAP. Then you have got TPM, which is ISO IC 11889. You have got cryptographic modules, hardware service modules, or hardware security modules, excuse me, and then smart cards. So in secure crypto processors, the idea is to isolate hardware security by reducing attack surface of any privileged operation, right? Some properties of secure crypto processors are that they are resistant to hardware tampering. They, are, they have limited interfaces which means they have reduced attack surface. They are easy, these, these are easier to verify the integrity and secure operation of code. So, so these are some of the secure crypto processor properties, but these are not the only properties. There may be other properties as well. But uh, the important thing for exams uh, point of view, you should know that uh, uh, what are the risks associated with these security crypto processors. So the table which I'm showing here in the diagram is very important from exams perspective. So in this table, you can see that you have got different secure crypto processors like security enclave, TPM, cryptographic modules, HSMs, and a smart card, right? And then you have got a brief description, use case, and risk. I will explain one by one. So secure enclave is, uh, the description of secure enclave is to isolate area within a processor. So you have got a processor and then you isolate an area within a processor for, crypt for cryptographic operations. Right. This is uh, uh, most prevalent in mobile devices or biometric authentication. So these are the use case. What risk it may have? It may have side channel attacks. Right. So this is secure enclave. Now TPM, Trusted Platform Module, is a specific type of cryptographic module. So you have got cryptographic modules, um, which are which is uh, which may be hardware and software. But when it comes to TPM, TPM is always a hardware integrated with computer on its motherboard. So in computer, you have got a motherboard and you have got this, uh, this TPM module inbuilt in that motherboard. So TPM is always hardware, it's not software. So uh, this should be, uh, uh, this, 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 thing, this is the thing you should know for exams, right? The, the TPM is always hardware. There may be some software running inside this hardware, but TPM itself exists as a hardware. Uh, module 
on the motherboard of the computer system. Uh, where it is used? It is used for secure boot, it is used for disk encryption, integrity attestation, etc. And uh, the only way um, this can be tempered is doing some physical attack. So physical attack is the risk. And I think you have, if we have uh, safely, if we have, if we have physical security for the computer system, we can mitigate this risk. Now, cryptographic modules may be both hardware and software. These are used based mostly in government and regulatory environment. Um, uh, you know, with uh, uh, FIPS as a standard. So, what are the risks associated with cryptographic modules? Because um, uh, because cryptographic model is something which is uh, which is uh, custom made specifically by a vendor uh, following FIPS guideline. So if that vendor is not uh, that appro that uh, reputed, it may produce a non-compliant uh, uh, cryptographic module. So we should always be uh, doing proper vendor assessment for uh, all the vendors who are pro who are actually producing. Or who are providing cryptographic modules for your, for your organization. Um, it may fail, so failure is always um, always a chance uh, and it, I think it's a risk for all the crypto processors. Design implementation error can be uh, there in cryptographic modules. So these are the risks for cryptographic modules. HSMs are dedicated hardware appliance, right? hardware security modules. Now these are these are used in um, in financial institutions, payment systems mostly, and the risk associated with HSMs are un uh, unauthorized access, hardware failure, or some physical attack. Right. So these are the risk with HSM. A smart cards are credit card size uh, device. Like um, it it's, it resembles credit card. This is used for authentication and secure access. Uh, typical use is two-factor authentication, secure access, electronic payment and the risk associated with the smart card is card tampering or interception. So this is all about um, the security primitives or security building blocks. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will, I will see you in next video and we will start uh, um, uh, cryptography formally by starting with uh, symmetric cryptography and then going to asymmetric and uh, exploring the world of uh, public key infrastructure. Thanks for watching the video. Hope to see you again in my next video.